neurons. Um, so uh, to give you a little bit of background uh, on me and um, as it pertains to photographing microminerals, I actually studied uh, electronics originally. Uh, I'll, I'll talk more uh, about this little box here later that actually plays into the process of uh, photography. Uh, but I've always been technically minded, uh, but artistically inclined. So I started off in electronics and uh, then decided I was going to be an actor and actually was a professional clown for a number of years. That, that really is my headshot. Um, but then I, uh, I went to uh, film school in, in, uh, in Welland, as a matter of fact, right here in Niagara. Uh, but landed behind the, the camera instead of in front of the camera. So uh, as Quentin mentioned, worked for a number of years in film and TV, uh, all the while indul indulging in my uh, childhood mm -hmm. passion for minerals. Um, and so eventually at some point I decided I was gonna put my, uh, my passion and my profession together and start doing mineral photography. You know, how hard could it be, right? So this actually is my very first attempt at, uh, at mineral photography. This is a uh, you know, large scale, of course, uh, just in my, in my basement, uh, very rudimentary. And the results, of course, were uh, similarly rudimentary. That's enough of that, get out of that quickly. But I kept working at it and you know, eventually uh, the results got better and I uh, kept working at it still and eventually earned the trust of uh, major museums and collectors. And, now I'm privileged to be able to photograph some of the world's uh, finest mineral specimens. And let me tell you, nothing elevates the, the caliber of your mineral photography more than really good minerals. Uh, they, uh, you know, you can be the best photographer in the world, but if, you, if all you've got is crappy uh, specimens, it's not gonna, nobody's gonna care to look at the pictures. Uh, the other uh, important note in terms of my process and, and what informs how I approach mineral photography is I also work primarily for print. Uh, not all of my photographs get published necessarily, but I always uh, want to be able to protect for the option of uh, publication. Uh, you know, it's one thing for a photograph to look good on Facebook or Instagram. It's quite another uh, to uh, stand up on its own in print. Uh, print is very unforgiving. So uh, everything that I do, uh, I, I want to at least be able to uh, print at some point as, as large as possible, uh, ideally. So when it came time to uh, work on the book about the Pinch Collection at the Canadian Museum of Nature, uh, I had to really make sure that I was uh, up to the task. So that was my impetus for starting uh, photomicroscopy was having to photograph a lot of very small, very rare things in, in the uh, William Pinch Collection. And so this here is my first attempt at um, uh, photomicroscopy. And similar to my first attempt at mineral photography generally, uh, reality did not quite meet with expectation. Uh, and of course I had to relearn that first lesson, which is uh, better specimens equals better photos. Uh, but it turns out I didn't have any good micros. So I, uh, I went uh, running around my basement and garage collecting insects and bugs to, uh, to practice with. That's what, uh, that's what this guy actually looks like. It's, there he is in my hand. Um, so, uh, I mean, at this point I didn't even, I didn't even own a microscope, uh, but Interestingly, coincidentally, uh, just I, th I think it was like the same week that I that I was just starting this process. Uh, a friend of mine who uh, worked at the local dump uh, showed up in my house and say, "Hey, somebody was uh, throwing this out. You want it?" <laughs> yep. Okay. So there's my first my first microscope. All right. So now I'm well on my way. I've got I've got uh, the camera set up. I've got the microscope, but uh, still no specimen. So. Uh, I, I just started looking at whatever uh, normal specimens I, I had in my collection, but now with a microscope, of course, I'm seeing these things. Uh, is a Seganite from Nanocific. Actually, I'm not going to narrate all the specimens, the information is there. If you have any questions, feel free. But um, anyway, so that's also uh, what got me uh, interested in Monsé de Lair. Of course, I got sucked in there. I uh, had a lovely uh, specimen of pink albite, which actually turns out was a much better uh, Nidikevagite uh, uh, specimen. So that was fun. But for the most part, the stuff that I had in my collection was all fairly uh, standard, fairly common stuff. So uh, eventually I even uh, ended up buying some specimens specifically so that I could uh, start having some things to practice with. And again, getting better. Uh, so, you know, the good news was I learned that there, um, there were some transferable skills uh, such as lighting. So here's a, a sort of uh, overview of the lighting setup for that uh, garnet that you saw previously. And you can see the sort of similarity in the lighting setup here for my uh, micros here. 
my, my entire setup has evolved considerably since this point, but the basics are the same, especially in terms of the principles of lighting. Um, other um, uh, aesthetic aspects of photography also are uh, fully uh, transferable, such as framing. So this is, this is um, an example of the, the full shot, the full field of view. Everything is in full focus, but there's a lot of distraction there. So um, the uh, art of photography uh, suggests that I uh, should isolate the subject a little bit more. So you notice here I've taken uh, the uh, outside specimens out of focus there so that your eye is drawn more to the, the dominant crystal in the center there. Uh, center weighted framing is a whole other discussion, but whatever, it works for this. Um, now, uh, of course, ideally, uh, every, this one's for you, Frank, uh, every, every shot is going to be both artistic and as close to technically perfect um, as, as possible. Um, so the harder part of things, though, rather than the, the artistic side, was the technical side of things. This is, this is my, uh, closer to my current setup. It's changed a little bit uh, still since then. But uh, yeah, so the, the technical challenges uh, proved to be the part that was non-transferable, or at least that I had to work on, especially when moving into photomicroscopy. Uh, because you know whether I'm photographing something like this or something like this, and this is, uh, this is from one of Beth's, um, uh, you know, the result, like I said, has to be, has to be aesthetically ple pleasing and as close to, uh, as close to technically perfect as, as possible because I need to protect for print and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, but I just wasn't there yet. Uh, back to the bugs here. So, uh, just as, as an example, um, so here, another from, uh, Frank's collection here, uh, uh, this is, I mean, this, this looks pretty good, uh, especially for the field of view. If you'll note, that's one millimeter field of view. That's the full width there is one millimeter. Um, and this is kind of what I was talking about, the difference between Facebook and print. You know, if we zoom in on that, we start to see the, the sort of stuff that keeps me up at night. And, uh, you know, if this was a small placement or if it was on Facebook, that's perfectly acceptable. But you know, I'm, I'm not going to be making any poster size prints because when you blow it up, that's all you're going to be, all you're going to be seeing. Um, and interesting side note on physics here, by the way, um, you see, see the rings around the points there? Uh, that's uh, called the airy disk, and that's actually part of the wave function of light. You're actually seeing the wave function of light there as it's propagating out through, uh, through diffraction. Um, so physics plays into this as well. Um, so uh, not to suggest that the artistic side of it is easy, but that was sort of more, more my ken. So, and that's a whole other talk. So what I'm going to be focusing on today is, is more the technical side of things, because those are the particular challenges that people often tend to have. Uh, but before we get into all of the stuff that can go wrong, um, I'm going to cover uh, a few basics first. So like, uh, for one, um, people, people often ask why I don't use a microscope uh, based system to photograph my, my specimens. Um, so number one, uh, there we go, uh, cost. Uh, you know, I already had the, the, all of, most of the camera parts that I would need to be able to set something up using my camera, whereas uh, a good trinocular uh, microscope system, sufficient for doing this kind of photography, <laughs> many thousands of dollars. Uh, so I wasn't prepared to invest in that just yet. Um, uh, plus I'm a photographer, so of course that's my default. I'm, I, I even have a microscope, as I said. So, uh, but all that said, uh, you can't beat the versatility of the camera-based system. So, for example, um, with the camera-based system, if I wanted a camera, I just I, it's a very easy job. Just a different adapter, get a new camera. Now, of course, you can replace micro microscope cameras as well, but the cameras that are designed specifically for microscope use. Uh, tend to be fairly low resolution just for video uh, monitoring, that sort of stuff, or quick snapshots, that sort of thing. You can adapt um, uh, proper uh, high, higher end cameras to microscopes as well. But um, you know, if you've got a good camera to start with, why not? Uh, the real versatility though comes in terms of the lenses. So like with a, um, uh, oh, sorry, and stacking actually, we'll come back to the lenses. So, uh, Stacking is uh, not impossible with a micro -ba microscope based system, but it, it's uh, tedious and difficult. Uh, also uh, tends to be less accurate um, because you're just relying, I mean, you've got the fine focus knob, it's very, it's very uh, precise, very fine, 
but they're typically not indexed, so you can't do re repeatable, uh, reliable, accurate steps. Uh, plus, you're sitting there doing it uh, manually the whole time. So um, just uh, for those of you that uh, may not be familiar with the concept of stacking, I'll talk about that for a sec. Uh, boy, Frank is the real star of the show here. Um, so in order to get something like this, uh, where uh, you know parts of this this photograph are are not in focus, so like it starts to fall out of focus here, it falls out of focus in the back, uh, but the whole of the main crystal, the main area of interest, is all in focus. But in order to achieve that, um, I have to take uh, many many individual shots that look like this. So this is the the natural depth of field of the uh, of the uh, the optical system. And similar to what you would see in a microscope as well, although microscopes tend to have deeper depth of field. Um, but so there's that area in the front that is out of focus, the area in back that is out of focus, and there's just that sharp uh, line, that plane of focus in the middle there. That's what's referred to as the depth of field. So the amount that is in focus in any one shot, that is the depth of field. And so what you need to do in focus stacking uh, in order to achieve uh, a deep focus uh, like that is you have to take a series of photographs. Oh, actually, yeah. So here's um, at, at any given time in you know the ideal uh, optical system, there is actually a plane of focus, not a point of focus, but a plane of focus uh, in front of the lens. And strictly speaking, the only thing that is in focus is is that you know if, uh, infinitesimally thin plane of focus. But there is this area just in front and just behind of the plane of focus which is close enough, basically, or it's uh, acceptably sharp. And so that's your depth of field, is that sort of gray area outside of the plane of focus. And so for, image, or for focus stacking, it relies on uh, taking multiple shots where you're overlapping that depth of field uh, so that you generate, or so that you have a, a series of shots from which you can generate uh, a composite image. And so here is the series for that particular shot. Do, 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 do. So there's overlapping depth of field between each of them. So that then you, you take all of those individual shots, you feed them into the software and voila. So that's the basics of image stacking. Uh, and this is, this is obviously critical for, um, it, it gets more critical at higher magnifications. It gets more critical um, for very deep specimens. Uh, certain small crystals, uh, you can align into the plane of focus reasonably well, but you know, if you want to get any off axis uh, angle on the piece or whatever, it starts to get fairly deep and stacking is very important. So for this particular shot, uh, for example, uh, 427 individual photographs, um, depth of field on each of the individual photographs in this case uh, was around eight microns. So my, my stacking depth was about five microns to overlap by three microns each one. So it, it gets, uh, uh, pretty demanding after a while. So 427 shots sitting at a microscope manually one by one tweaking, you know, obviously that's not particularly uh, feasible in this case. Um, so that's why uh, also I've invested in a uh, stack shot uh, here, which is uh, right here. This is the mount that my, that my camera system is, is on. And uh, that's a computer controlled uh, stepping motor, uh, which moves the camera repeatedly uh, accurately by a, a determined um, uh, distance. And so uh, in the computer, I can just say start here and there, the, uh, the uh, distance of the stack is five microns, go, it calculates how many shots it needs and it does the thing. Um, now this isn't, what is that? It is, yeah, oh, it's, it's, a, it's an indispensable piece of equipment for sure. For, uh, now in, I, I do this professionally, so it's, uh, I can justify the cost and uh, I need to, to have that so that I'm not sitting there for hours doing it manually. But strictly speaking, it's not necessary. Um, if you notice in my, in my first setup here, underneath the camera, I have uh, a single stage micrometer, uh, which I just bought off of eBay, and it's accurate to resolution of five, uh, five micrometers. Um, so you can actually do some, some pretty uh, accurate uh, high magnification stacking manually. It's just a real pain to sit there in the basement for three hours while you're doing it. Um, and plus the handling of the camera is less than ideal at high magnifications, all that sort of stuff. So uh, I mentioned earlier, the other advantage of the camera-based system is uh, versatility with respect to the lenses that are available to you. So um, of course, most microscopes, you can change the lenses uh, uh, and 
often you've got the zoom microscopes as well, but whatever the system is designed for, you're fixed into that, that system, basically. Uh, with a camera-based system, uh, you know, any number of lenses, including microscope objectives, uh, so you can have a, a range of magnification from infinitely wide to infinitely small with the, the right lenses and the right adapters. So uh, the versatility there is important with a camera-based system. So uh, here we go. This is, this is for you, Quentin. There's, uh, there's the Pentax. That's the K01, which is Pentax's mirrorless camera. Uh, I recently, uh, sorry, Quentin, I recently upgraded to a Sony um, just because this one is 10 years old, this camera, and now has 500,000 shutter acu acu uh, activations on it. Um, so it basically, it's, it's going to die on me any day, and I can't have it die in the middle of an important job, so I, so I got a new camera. There's some interesting new features with the, the Sony, but it, it basically, uh, the camera is really the least important part of the whole system. Uh, if you focus your attention on really good high-quality optics, high, high optical resolution, the camera is largely immaterial. You will you you can't take a bad picture with uh, with any camera that was you know made in the last five years. Um, so don't worry so much about the camera. There is plenty more to talk about. If anybody has a particular question, I'd be happy to answer. But don't worry about the camera for now. Right now we're focused on the lenses. So uh, starting with the macro lens, uh, standard macro lens, uh, just like any camera lens, you can focus to infinity, so you can uh, have full wide. But what uh, distinguishes one of the features that distinguishes a macro lens. Uh, like what is true macro photography is that it's a one-to-one -one reproduction uh, ratio or one X magnification. So uh, here's a picture of a ruler and the width of the sensor on that camera is roughly one inch plot. So at one uh, times magnification, uh, the field of view exactly matches the width of the sensor, which is roughly one inch. So if I focus in on one inch of the ruler, that correlates exactly to one inch field of view at, at the sensor. So that's what makes a true macro lens is that one to one reproduction ratio. Uh, if you wanna go beyond one to one, then we're into other options, one of which is uh, reverse mount lenses. So if you take a wide angle lens, uh, like a, a, a 28 or a 35 millimeter lens, under normal circumstances, you have uh, a wide uh, area, a field of view. And then that compresses that down into a smaller area on the, on the image plane of the sensor. But if you reverse that lens, you get instead um, a very narrow field of view, which then is expanded onto the, uh, onto the, the sensor, the image plane. There. So that's how the, the reverse uh, magnification works. And that's good from about um, three to five uh, times magnification using the reverse mounted lenses. Um, then we have uh, various strategies to uh, extend the magnification range beyond the natural, uh, beyond what's dictated by the optics. And so primarily that's just through extension. So these extension tubes, what that does is where if we might have a one-to-one -one magnification under normal circumstances, if we extend the distance of the image plane, if we double that, we double the magnification. If we double that again, the distance, we get double the magnification again. So basically just moving the lens further away from the sensor gives you greater magnification with any lens that's, uh, that's standard. Um, and so if you need more extension than the, the standard uh, extension tubes would give you, you can look at bellows. So there's closed and open. And basically that's like a zoom uh, in, in, like in the realm of uh, photomicroscopy. The bellows is like a zoom. So you can extend or, or uh, shrink the, um, the field of view by opening or closing the bellows. And um, then you can pair the bellows with uh, various dedicated close-up lenses. Um, this particular one is my up to, it's a 50 millimeter reversed. It gets me up to two uh, times magnification. Uh, and then we can, you know, with, uh, with the appropriate adapters, we can get microscope uh, uh, objectives on there and, you know, decrease our field of view even more. So um, this is, uh, so, with microscope objectives. By the way, this is this is uh, there's some technical stuff in here, just a little bit. But uh, being that you're all uh, uh, micro mirror collectors, I assume that you uh, can handle a little bit of uh, technical detail here. So um, with microscope ob objectives, you may have uh, heard the difference between a finite uh, objective and an infinite uh, infinite infinity corrected system. Uh, what that means basically is a finite objective is designed so that 
um, it comes to a terminal point of focus at the image plane, which is to say it, it focuses on a point on the subject and focuses that to a clear sharp point on the uh, image plane. Uh, infinity corrected op uh, optics don't come to a, a clear point of focus. They, uh, all of the rays come out the, the rear end of the lens uh, in parallel, focused at infinity. And so you can't actually get uh, uh, an image out of an infinity corrected objective by itself. Uh, you need to instead introduce a, a secondary, a tube lens that focuses, uh, focuses it to a, a point on the uh, image plane there. Uh, this sounds like a lot, but believe me, if, you're, if you want to start getting into this and you're looking at uh, microscope objectives and trying to gauge which ones should I buy, which ones, this is an important distinction. Uh, in terms of image quality, there's no real preference necessarily, just that most modern optics are designed for this infinity corrected system. So uh, modern optics are generally better uh, because technology has improved over older optics. So if you're looking for the best possible quality, you're probably gonna be looking at um, the infinite uh, system. So just be aware you need also this uh, auxiliary tube lens that I've got in there. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a closer look up at a closer look at the at the whole system altogether there. So I've got um, this is a 10x uh, infinity corrected objective. There's an auxiliary iris there. There's the tube lens, uh, extension tubes, plus the the bellows. And uh, in that particular configuration, that gets me up to about 12 times magnification right there. If I need more than that, um, I've seen I've seen where people have like unnaturally extended bellows or or you know found ways to extend the, the distance there. But uh, yeah, stacked bellows uh, is something I've seen. Uh, unfortunately, by the time you get to that much um, extension, you are increasing the magnification, yes, but you are also increasing all the optical defects of the system. And uh, so if this lens is rated at 10x, you start pushing that far beyond 10x, you're just um, magnifying an out of focus image, basically. It, it starts to turn into mush uh, because the optical resolution of the lens can't match that magnification. So yes, you can push that farther and get higher magnification, but you're not getting any more detail out of it beyond its nominally rated value. So, um, so instead, uh, if I need more, uh, more um, magnification than that, I just switch to a higher power objective. Uh, so I have I have also a 20x and a 50x. Yeah. What's the role of the iris? Uh, okay, so the role of the iris, I will come back to that. Uh, for those at home, the question was, what's the role of the iris? Uh, I will be talking about that uh, shortly. So um, all that to say, magnification is easy. Uh, you know, you just the right the right lenses, the right amount of uh, extension, you can get down to uh, in you know absurd fields of view, but uh, what's important is protecting for the detail, the, the resolution, the quality of the image at those high magnifications. Um, and so what can go wrong that will prevent us from achieving that, that kind of goodness? So there's mechanical problems, optical problems, problems of physics, which we started to talk about earlier, uh, and all of this compounded by magnification. So whatever problems you might be having uh, with your photomicroscopy at, uh, at moderate, modest uh, magnification. By the time you get up to uh, you know, 10, 15, 20x magnification, it's, it's a nightmare. So in terms of mechanical uh, problems by big vibrations is, is the, the biggest one. And so there, there's external sources of vibration and internal sources of vibration. Externally, stuff like kids running around, trucks driving by, you know, 50x sneezing will will shake the, the, the thing. Um, internal uh, internal vibrations, uh, such as the shutter going off. Uh, not every camera has a physical shutter, by the way. So, like especially dedicated microscope cameras tend not to have they have, they have an electronic shutter, so that's less of a concern. Uh, although the, the quality of those cameras tends not to be as good as those which do have a shutter. Uh, handling. So I was talking before about like, you know, if you're, if you're doing the manual stacking, each time you touch the rig, you're shaking it. But even just the stacking motor by itself in the, in the automated rig, that little tweak of the stepping motor will also send vibrations, which, um, so you can see here, uh, that dot in the background, by the way, that is uh, 70 microns across. It's a, it's a dot on a calibration slide. Um, and so this is 
solid. It's reasonably uh, well, like it's in focus. It's uh, reasonably uh, well captured, but but most importantly, it's it's sharp. It is solid. It's unmoving. There's no vibrations there. But in the next slide, you can see there's a sort of crescent moon effect on the top left, which indicates a, a direction of travel. There's a lateral movement there. So this is different than just like out of focus because you can see there is that direction of travel with that crescent moon. Uh, so this is an example of motion blur. And you know, when I talk about um, how this becomes a problem, this is an extreme example because this is actually taken, like I said, that's uh, 70 microns across. So it's extremely high magnification. And that was taken with a flash at a very, at a very uh, short uh, shutter speed. So you would think that a flash, which is a very short duration burst of light, would be enough to freeze uh, all vibration. But as a matter of fact, it's not. Like when you get into those high magnifications, even flash can't freeze it. So you have to start looking at different uh, strategies. So, you know, for the external uh, concerns, concrete floor really is, is the best thing. So just shoot in the garage or in the basement by shooting the basement. Uh, unless, unless you uh, like live on the 20th floor of a downtown skyscraper, uh, you can be uh, pretty stable just being on, on the concrete floor. Um, for internal flash certainly helps, um, adjusting your shutter speed, uh, though is, is the, uh, often the most important thing. So, um, referring back to the shot of my studio here, there's a couple of things, uh, to note. So here, here is my, my light here. This is the flash head, which, uh, you know, bombards the, the subject with, with light there. Um, I have my, my table is isolated from the, uh, from the uh, tape, or my work table is isolated from the table that has the camera on it. So if I'm typing away at the computer, I'm not shaking the, the whole thing. Um, there is also this uh, little box here that was in the picture at the beginning of the, of the slide. So what that box does is it's a, it's a, um, uh, a delayed timing rig. And so uh, when you think about the sequence of events of taking uh, a picture, Vibration um, from the shutter, at least, that's, that's a main concern at this point, the, that internal vibration. The, the, the vibration from the shutter is at the beginning of the shot. And so that's that, that wavy red line there. When, when the shutter releases, it creates vibration in the system. And so uh, in the top example, that's like the worst case scenario because you can see the amount of time that the shutter is open exactly matches the amount of time the vibration is happening. And so all you're getting is vibration very bad. This is a constant um, illumination situation, by the way. So this is like a light that you turn on uh, and it's, it's on and you just use whatever light is available. This isn't for the flash. Um, so that's where the real nightmare scenario is for vibrations, when that shutter speed is roughly equal to the length of time that vibrations are happening. Um, and you would think that the solution is to make the shutter speed shorter, to try and freeze that vibration uh, like you would do with sports photography, say. Uh, but in fact, that's just as bad because, again, that short period of shutter um, uh, opening also corresponds with the worst part of the vibration at the beginning of your shot. So instead, uh, if you're not using flash, the, the strategy, the best strategy to use is a much longer shutter speed, in fact, so that it averages out that vibration over a much longer, much more stable part of the exposure. So you lose the vibration in, in, in the, the much uh, better part of the of the shot there. So if you're not using flash, a longer shutter speed is actually your best de defense against that internal vibration. Um, so I am using flash, but because of that that uh, upfront shutter vibration, um, I don't want my flash going off at the top because it's the same as having the shutter go off at the top for a short duration, and and we get that motion blur. So instead, um, I, I need what's called a rear curtain sink. So I have a long exposure time in, in blackness to let the vibration settle down. And then the flash fires just at the very end of the exposure, then the shutter closes. And so that eliminates all vibration. In the, thing. the box that I, that I had to build there is to delay the timing of the flash because it, the camera doesn't have an internal rear, rear curtain sink for that. But uh, certain models of camera do have an internal uh, rear curtain sink like that. So if you are using flash, that's the key uh, part of the strategy is the, re the rear curtain sink. Okay, time for just an eye candy break. I think we deep breath, some lovely phosphosiderite from Utah. Uh, one of probably only three specimens of tripkeite, chili. So this is the kind of stuff that I had to prepare myself for with the, uh, the 
Pinch Collection, uh, another one of Beth's, some, uh, some industrial, uh, industrial micro diamonds. Uh, you can see the, the scale bar there for, uh, for size. Uh, one of my favorite things uh, in, in this line of work is that uh, I'm, I'm called upon regularly to photograph type specimens. Uh, and so uh, type specimen is, is uh, the specimen from which a new species is described. It's the exemplar of a new species. It's, uh, uh, so in this case, Galtite, uh, Dr. Bob Galt of the Canadian Museum of Nature. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and there's Bob. There we go. Um, so uh, now we've got that out of our system. Back to some more technical fun stuff. So optical problems. What can go wrong from the optical side of things? Uh, this, by the way, is, uh, is um, uh, an integrated circuit board, uh, a, a silicone wafer uh, that's been etched, but before it's been cut into the individual microprocessor chips, makes a fantastic test target because uh, micron level detail in there. So uh, again, here we are looking at an ideal, uh, grossly simplified optical system here, where we have a sharp point of focus in the, on the object side uh, and a sharp point of focus on the image plane. But in reality, uh, things never work out quite that well. Uh, anybody who's ever done any regular photography is probably aware of the concept of the sweet spot of a lens, that if you shoot wide open, uh, you have various optical problems. If you close the aperture down too far, then you have various other optical problems. So that uh, so by adjusting the aperture somewhere in the middle of its range is that sort of sweet spot of the lens. And so the, the, the physics behind that is um, at the open end, there's, there's what's called uh, spherical aberration that will mess with the image quality of your, your image. And what's happening there is that um, especially older lenses were cut from an actual sphere. There's a spherical radius uh, to, the, uh, to the lens there. And... Uh, Although that was easy, easier from a manufacturing standpoint, it's not as good from an optical standpoint because the rays of light that are hitting the edges of the lenses aren't actually playing nice with the others and coming to that clear point of focus. So we get this sort of uh, spreading out of the, of the uh, rays instead of focusing to a fine point. And that's um, called spherical aberration or sometimes coma. Uh, so an aspherical lens, this is what mo most modern lenses will include an aspherical element exactly for this that helps to correct that. So again, uh, you know, if you're looking at microscope objectives or any lens generally, newer lenses for reasons like this are going to be naturally better. There are some old excellent lenses, don't get me wrong, but uh, generally speaking, uh, newer ones would be better for stuff like that. Now at the opposite end of the scale, um, if you close down your, your aperture or the iris back of the camera too much, um, that, that corrects for spherical aberration because it eliminates the rays of light that are coming from the, out, the extreme outside of the, of the lens. Uh, so you've solved the, the spherical aberration problem. But if you go too far with the iris, now you have a new problem, which is diffraction, uh, which is the tendency of uh, light rays to, to diverge as they, uh, they pass through a narrow iris. And uh, so this is what I was talking about as well in terms of pushing that magnification too far. Um, it's the aperture of the lens that determines its resolution, or it's the primary factor that determines the optical resolution of the, of the lens. So shooting wide open is preferable for high resolution, but uh, you often have to close down, which is the purpose of my iris, you have to close down some to eliminate that spherical aberration. But if you go too far, diffraction, but that also applies if you uh, extend the optics too far. If you increase the, the distance between the, uh, the lens and the camera too far, it's the same effect as closing an iris. You're, you, you're generating more diffraction. So the farther and farther you go with magnification, once you reach that uh, diffraction limit, you're just magnifying mush. Uh, you're not getting any more detail. You're, just, you're getting closer, but it's just fuzzy uh, uh, magnification. Yes, so, um, so chromatic aberrations is next. Um, and uh, so yeah, the, the plan uh, uh, designation on microscopes, we, what that means is a planar, uh, a planar um, uh, plane of focus. Uh, so that uh, on the objective or the, on the object side there where the little crystal is, there's that little line through the center of the crystal. If you imagine that to be the plane of focus, um, in a true optical system, actually, you will find usually that that is radial, that it, that it follows uh, the curvature of the lens. And so 
you might have the middle in sharp focus, but as it, as it curves back at the, at the top and the bottom, you're losing focus there. So a plan uh, or an objective that has that plan designation has a flat field of focus. Um, that's less critical if you're focused at it, because even if the field of focus or the plane of focus isn't flat, you'll catch everything in focus as you travel through the specimen. But yeah, the, the plan is, is worth knowing. So anyway, that's uh, diffraction. So between these two extremes, the spherical aberration and the diffraction is that sweet spot in the middle. And so real world examples, this is a, a photograph by um, the 50 millimeter close-up lens I mentioned before. Um, this is a six millimeter field of view. So four times at the sensor plane. Um, if I crop into just one millimeter uh, of that area, so it's now 24 times, uh, it's getting a little fuzzy. You can see the limitations of that lens there, uh, but this is at 5.6. Uh, and, and that is actually the best that that lens can achieve at that magnification, which is to say, I wouldn't want to go any farther with magnification on that lens. But if we look at it wide open, you can see the, the, the change in contrast there. So that's at 5.6 wide open, see how much fuzzier it is at uh, wide open. That's the spherical aberration. Um, and then if I go to the other extreme, if I close it down to F11, it gets even worse. And that's the effect of diffraction. So 5.6 is looking much better now all of a sudden. Even though this is at the limit of that, that lens's magnification capability, that is still the sweet spot for this lens. Um, and so uh, for my microscope objectives, which don't have a built-in iris, I have an auxiliary iris in between the objective and the tube lens, uh, which allows me to close it down just enough to eliminate the spherical aberrations from the lens uh, while not uh, encroaching into diffraction limitation territory. In microscopy, at least, the iris is also used for glare, yeah. so also enhances the depth of focus. Yes. So, uh, Another excellent point, which we will come to in a moment. So, uh, but for the glare that you're talking about, that's, that's more the iris on the um, illuminator uh, than, than the objective iris, but yeah. Uh, so, next uh, thing to talk about is the chromatic aberrations, which is what you talked about there. So, uh, again, designations on microscope objectives, you will uh, often see um, apochromat, uh, which is the, the uh, creme de la creme of uh, optical corrections. That means it is corrected uh, to the extent possible for every possible chromatic ab uh, aberration. Um, the particular series of lenses that I, or objectives that I use are uh, Nikon uh, CF, which stands for chrome free, um, which is not apochromat, but it's chrome free. Uh, that refers specifically to latitudinal uh, chromatic aberrations. So again, ideal, optical system. Uh, in fact, red, green, and blue, well, different wavelengths of light refract at diff to different degrees. So if we just break it down to the primaries, red, green, blue, you can see the extent to which they, they, are, they diverge as they go through the optical medium. Um, they, in, in an ideal world, they would all be perfectly corrected and then come back to a, a point of purpose, perfect focus. However, they don't. Um, instead, what tends to happen is they tend uh, to diverge. And so microscope or lens, lens makers will prefer the focus on the green because that's what our eyes are most sensitive to. That's what determines the overall luminance of an image is the green. Uh, whereas, uh, and you know, they try to the extent possible to correct for red and blue, but if that's not perfect, then, then they kind of leave that go. But in a chrome-free lens, this is well corrected. So we tend not to have these uh, latitudinal uh, chromatic aberration, which appear as that red, red blue or red green split. Um, Longitudinal uh, chromatic aberrations are in the other axis along the longitudinal axis of the lens here. So in this case, we have green focused well on the image plane, but red and blue are, are uh, off somewhere else. And if they're, if they're back here, it's purple. If they're on this side, it appears as green. And so that's the longitudinal, and that's what an apochromat uh, lens is corrected for, both latitudinal and longitudinal. Uh, so if you, uh, if you, if you can afford it, uh, and, uh, you know, buy apochromat lenses are ideal, except, uh, problem there is working distance. So, uh, apochromat, uh, lenses also tend to be very high NA, which is the microscope objective measure of its aperture. 
So as opposed to iris in a standard camera, there's numerical aperture. And so the higher the, the uh, numerical aperture, the better the resolution of that lens, but also the shorter the working distance. So there is, again, like it's sort of a happy medium between a perfect optical system, which is impossible to use, and a messy optical system, which is much more user-friendly. User and so um, Apple Chromat is, is better, but diff more difficult to work with. So, but now you know what that's for. Uh, so lens choice obviously is, is important. Like all of this stuff, it's, it's not necessary to understand all the technical details, but it, uh, it's helpful. Uh, this is my process. This is how I came to understand all this stuff. But at the end of the day, really all of this is to say lens choice is the single most important uh, factor in determining a high quality optical system. Um, and so for any, any photomicroscopy system, whether it's camera based or microscope based, the lenses that you, that, uh, that you choose are going to be the single most, uh, the single, uh, most important determining factor in the quality of your end results. So if you're looking for specific recommendations, um, this, uh, Russian lens made by Lomo, um, is, uh, is still in my kit. This is the very first, uh, microscope objective I ever bought to experiment with. It was $10 on eBay. It remains one of the very best in my entire kit. Um, so it's a 3.5X, uh, the numerical aperture is 0.1. Uh, brand is Lomo, L-O-M-O, -O, just uh, search it on eBay. Uh, and it's perfect in like the three to five um, uh, times magnification range. Uh, so that, yeah, that's, that's a great lens. Uh, but also having a choice of lenses, like I said, so you don't try to push any one lens too far in its magnification range and start losing resolution. Uh, instead, you want to be able to switch up to higher, uh, higher magnification lenses. So this is, this is uh, Nikon's uh, CF uh, range, well, it's CF plan. And so again, if you're looking for recommendation in the 10, 20, and 50 uh, times range, the, the Nikon CF uh, are really good. Um, other uh, pros in this field use the, the Mirutoyu uh, lenses, uh, which are obscenely expensive, um, unnecessarily so, in my opinion. Uh, they are Apple Chromat, so in theory, they are better corrected for chromatic aberrations. Um, but they are longer working distances, which means they have a lower numerical aperture, which means they're actually lower resolution than the Nikon ones for an equivalent field of view. So, um, the other thing about the chromatic aberrations is that's generally well corrected in software nowadays too. So even if you do have a lens with a little bit of chromatic aberration, not such a big, as much of a big deal as it would be in a, in a single shot standalone system. So, uh, so this is, this is the ideal that I have settled on for now, but I mean, there's plenty of other lenses out there and plenty more to test, but for now, the best lenses that I found in that range are the, are the Nikon CF, uh, plan. Those are infinity corrected ones. Yeah, this one is a finite lens. This one is infinity corrected. So I'm also changing the tube lenses. I'm changing the lenses. Um, but if you want those, but if you want, you know, these kind of results, that's that's what it takes. So, um, sorry. Whoa. Oh, get, wait. It'll come back to me. So. Um, yeah, no, so that's, I've, I've mostly dispensed with uh, the technical stuff here. So just, just to sort of recap, you know, there is, there is a very uh, technical, very scientific uh, aspect to high quality photomicroscopy, but of course, at the end of the day, don't forget the art either. And, uh, you know, when I, when I say the art of the, the, the photograph, I don't mean to the extent of like, you know, oversaturating colors and, you know, distorting sizes and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I consider what I do to be equal parts scientific documentation and artistic representation. So because I work for print, uh, you know, what I do has to look good or people wouldn't be interested. So to the extent possible, I will try and take an aesthetically pleasing image, uh, but not to the extent that it would compromise the accuracy of, uh, of what's being portrayed. So, uh, but within that, there's still plenty of room for, for art. Uh, and, and a lot of that has to do with the lighting, of course, as, as well. Now, um, lighting, uh, again, is, is a whole other talk. Uh, so I'm not going to get too, uh, too much into detail there. Um, but suffice it to say that the basic principles of the lighting for, uh, for photomicroscopy are the same for lighting anything. 
uh, and, and so in mineral photography, primarily that means getting the reflections off of the crystal faces where you want them so that you can see the, um, uh, the structure of the mineral uh, appropriately in the photograph. So, no, this is, uh, it's uh, a flash. So it's a, um, uh, a xenon uh, flash tube. Yeah. Uh, for, okay, well, actually that, that is a... Oh, that's just a mirror. So there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's a mirror at the end of the blue stack there. Um, the light source is over here, just off of camera. It's, it's a flash source, but it does have a halogen modeling light. So there, there's, a, there's a, a halogen constant light there, which allows me to model the light before I actually uh, fire the flash. Up. And uh, yeah, so in, uh, I will actually touch on that briefly in terms of um, lighting source, cho choice of lighting source. Um, flash uh, is ideal because of its color rendition. Uh, of any artificial source, flash, flash has the best full spectrum response closest to natural daylight. So um, uh, for the best, uh, most accurate reproduction of the colors of the specimen, flash is ideal. That's why I use flash. It's a pain in the ass for a whole other lot of reasons, however. Um, second best to that, if you're not using flash, uh, is just a plain old halogen source or tungsten source. Um, and so when I say tungsten source, that's just a regular incandescent that would you know, screw into a, a light socket. Um, halogen is a bit better, uh, but in essence, they're both tungsten sources. And, and so roughly equivalent in terms of color reproduction. A lot of people are using LEDs now. Um, and, you know, like for regular microscopy, when you're just looking through the lens and uh, an LED source is, is generally fine. But um, LEDs are problematic in that they are, it's the wild west right now. There's no uh, reliable standards for uh, LEDs, both in terms of their spectral output and in terms of um, their dimming. So th uh, they'll, they'll often flicker when they're dimming. And so if you have a combination of a flickering LED with an electronic uh, shutter, you can get just like bands of exposure and then, and then, and then uh, blackout bands and whatnot. So, um, but also even if they're constant, uh, the color reproduction is, is, I mean, there are good LEDs out there, but you don't know what you're buying until you buy it and test it. And so uh, the most, accurate, most reliable source and cheapest also, fortunately, is just the straight up halogen source. So uh, if you're looking for a source of, uh, or a recommendation for lighting source, halogen is it. And that applies to my photomicroscopy and photography generally. Um, Any trick that you would try to do fluorescent? Uh, oh, uh, yes. I, um, well, I, I'll have an example, so I'll come, I'll come to that later. Wait, always one step ahead of me, aren't you, aren't you Michael? That's right. <laughs> It's not quite next, but uh, yeah, it's a little bit ahead of me. Um, so once you, so yeah, uh, you, uh, you put all of those factors together and you've taken this masterpiece and then you get into the computer. And then of course the last piece of the, of the puzzle is software these days, you know. Um, so in, when I was first starting uh, in, in uh, mineral photography it was around the same time that the transition was happening from film to digital. Uh, I bought one of the very first uh, available consumer model uh, digital uh, cameras. I've worked in film for 15 years in motion picture, so I'm, I'm no stranger to film. I have nothing against film, but there was this weird aversion to Photoshop uh, during that early transition to digital that still sort of lingers somewhat today. Everybody's like, as a point of pride, seems to say, oh, I don't use Photoshop. Well, okay, then you're missing out. Uh, because like, so, uh, if you, if you are saying I don't use Photoshop as a distinction to say I am not artificially altering the appearance of the subject, great, good for you. Um, but if you are just as a, as, a, as a point of stubborn pride, I don't use Photoshop because somehow that's better, you're wrong. Um, and by the way, I didn't mean to look directly at you when I said you're wrong, it's just happenstance. Um, so the idea is that you know in, uh, in the days of film, you would take a picture, you would take it to the lab, somebody is processing that film for. Uh, equally, nowadays, you take a picture in digital, it still has to be processed, just the onus is on you now as, the, as your own digital lab to do that processing. But the, but the basic principle behind film developing and digital developing is, is absolutely identical. Uh, and there is nothing that you can do in Photoshop now, including airbrushing and cut and paste, that wasn't invented in the era of film. So this idea that Photoshop is somehow inherently cheating is, is uh, ridiculous. Uh, but you shouldn't use Photoshop to cheat. 
let's put that out there. So what can we, should we do with software? What should we expect from our software? So this is the uh, straight out of stacking results uh, um, for this particular image. And what you will notice here is there's various artifacts uh, surrounding the, uh, the subject, this ghosting here. Those are uh, artifacts of the out of focus areas in parts of the stack. Are you using Photoshop to stack? No, I'm using Zarene Stacker uh, as my stacking software. Uh, but you know, as far as I can tell, uh, Zarene, Helicon, Combine, Combine Z, they're all they're all fine. They're all good. Uh, I prefer Zarene because it um, it's less user friendly than Helicon, but more powerful. Ultimately, it, it gives more of the control to the user rather than hiding them behind you know friendly sliders and buttons and such. Yes, you can uh, at a cost. Um, if you wouldn't mind asking me, that is a question at the end. I'll come back to that because that's a bit of a divergence. But uh, but oh, yes. Unintended? Oh yes. Well, no, actually. But thank you for thank you for pointing it out. Um, all right. So back to this though for a moment. Uh, so yeah, I use I happen to use Zarene uh, uh, Stacker, but they're all good. Uh, Photoshop also does do uh, stacking internally. It's terrible. Don't use Photoshop for stacking more than like three or four uh, shots. If you're doing uh, even up to a dozen, don't use Photoshop. So um, these artifacts, and, and now something else to point out as well is this is the full stack, like for, right from very deep focus to, to top focus. There are areas that are still out of focus which is just like the artistic side of it. I don't need that, that's not important information. I'm gonna leave that blurry to, to help focus the viewer's attention. But this is everything that I captured on this subject and just uh, default, well, not default settings, but you know, standard settings uh, straight through, this is what it comes up with. Now, obviously this is not a result I'm proud of. I'm gonna be publishing anytime soon. So uh, this is where the other uh, manual uh, intervention comes, uh, comes in. And within the stacking software, one of the things that it allows you is a, um, uh, a retouching feature. So uh, within Zarene Stacker, I'm sure there's uh, equivalent feature, well, there is in, in Helicon, uh, you can basically take this final result and then go back to preliminary versions, uh, the, the, um, the constituent photographs, and you can take parts of this and, and transfer them into the final result. So basically, I'm just using parts of the original to erase the artifacts of the stacking around the edges there. So this is, so this is the, the uh, untouched result. This is the retouched result. So now I've gotten rid of all of the, the software artifacts. And that's, that's more a function of a very deep stack, by the way, those artifacts. A shallower stack, it's not gonna be as much of a problem. No, this is still all within Zarene because this requires access to the original shots at the same time as, as, the, as the end result. I could do that in Photoshop, but it's all built in within Serene, so it's much better. So, uh, so this is the, the retouching result. So step one, stack. Step two, manual retouching. Um, step, uh, oh yeah, this is, uh, I should also mention there, there are two basic algorithms for stacking. Uh, this is the result from DMAP or depth map, uh, which tends to produce a, a more overall appealing uh, result. But then there's the Pmax or pyramid. Um, uh, scheme, which uh, is much better at uh, seeing around corners, if you will, but the end result is not as pleasing. So like, for example, uh, the contrast is really harsh here. You see those highlights, they tend to flare out in the, in the Pmax. Also, the, um, uh, there's a lack of color. Uh, all of the color has been sucked out of the, the Pmax. So where the, um, this is also part of the retouching process. So you see here these edges where there's, these, there's still these weird artifacts there. The only way to get rid of that is by retouching, by combining with parts of the, the Pmax. So I, I, I stack both Pmax and Dmap at the same time, and then that all becomes a part of my retouching workflow. Um, but then also, one other little um, artistic touch, uh, I mentioned earlier about blurring out certain areas or rather uh, taking them out of focus. Um, this is the final retouch result. So even though I captured all of this in focus, I just found it to be a distraction in the end. 
So instead, I retouched that part of the photo with, uh, from a, an original where that is out of focus. And instead, I isolate the subject like this so that we have a much clearer, uh, more appreciative uh, view of it where we can appreciate the subject much better. Um, but this is after uh, those, um, uh, well, three steps, I guess, the, the retouching or the stacking, the retouching, and then that final sort of artistic je ne sais quoi. Um, but then the final step is Photoshop. Now I take this and I go into Photoshop and, ooh, you know. Uh, so, and this is the part where, like, if, if I were to show you that, and then I would, and I say, and then I Photoshopped it, you're like, oh, well, you're cheating. That's so much better. You've enhanced it. Except this is much closer to what you're going to see under the microscope than this nebulous blob. Yes. Color. Yes. But it's not until you put it into Photoshop. Exactly. But I'm recovering the accurate color rather than adding some unnatural thing. So, I mean, it is there. The problem is, okay, well, so there's, there's a couple of things happening here. One, this, um, uh, this unprocessed, the stacked but unprocessed result is not quite color accurate. So I haven't done the final um, uh, white balance. So the color temperature of the light that I use is 5,600 degrees Kelvin. It doesn't always exactly match the setting in the camera. So this is the, the camera setting. Whereas once I go into Photoshop, I have the ability to point and click on a white source and, and perfectly neutralize the. I can, yeah, absolutely. So, so I mean, I could, I could make this a deep. It is, yeah. I mean, I could make this a deep purple, but, and, and now of course the other problem too, and I'll, I'll direct this to the viewers at home as well, is I have no idea what that looks like on your monitor at home. So like, you know, this, uh, this monitor, or this depiction of it here looks different than it does on the screen here. Yeah, so unless, unless you're looking at it on a calibra calibrated monitor or in a calibrated print, you can't know for sure whether that's accurate to what's actually in the file, which is the real gold standard of accuracy. So, but, but no, I mean, it's, it's, it's an important uh, part of the discussion as well is that accuracy part. And so in, in Photoshop though, I'm, so I'm doing that final color correction. I'm also, um, you know, uh, fixing the contrast and uh, just again, uh, not enhancing it unnaturally, but bringing it back to the point where it matches uh, our, our uh, understanding of it in reality. When the image comes out of the camera, does it come JPEG or raw? Or I shoot all in raw. Sometimes that's a necessary part of the process. Um, uh, however, I prefer to avoid that when possible because that can tend to introduce subjectivity into it. Like if I'm if I'm just eyeballing it by adjusting, well, there are ways to avoid eyeballing it though too. There are uh, sort of hard measures within Photoshop, but still, if you start manually adjusting the color like that, you could be introducing a subjective bias. Uh, instead, what I do is I just photograph a gray card and there's an automatic process to neutralize the, the, the color temperature from the gray card. Uh, that's the preferred method. That said, yes, sometimes I do get into tweaking the individual color channels for accuracy yeah. or, or contrast even. It, it requires sometimes, but yeah. Um, anyway, so then that, that becomes the final, final result is, is at once it's gone through all of that software processing. And so if everything comes together, the way it should, hopefully, then in the end, you will wind up with a result that is truly magical. Um, and boy, talk about color inaccuracies. You should see what that actually looks like in, in reality. <laughs> but again, it's not a fault of the photo, but of the monitor that you're viewing it on right now, but whatever, that's a whole other discussion. So about fluorescence. Um, yeah, uh, it, are there any special tricks for, for photographing fluorescence? Uh, we could get really technical here in terms of uh, wavelengths of light and, and optical resolutions and everything else, but uh, really, no. It's just, uh, you just have to make sure that the lenses you're using are not themselves fluorescent. So um, a, a common component of high quality lenses is fluorite glass. Uh, well, it's fluorite, it's not glass, but it's fluorite. Um, and of course, of course fluorite uh, isn't always necessarily fluorescent, but can be. And so, um, especially if you look at uh, older camera lenses that advertise fluorite elements, uh, they fluoresce like crazy. Um, my microscope objectives, uh, I've just been lucky in that they don't fluoresce. 
Uh, I don't know specifically what kind of glass they use or, or optical elements they, they use, um, but they happen to not be fluorescent. And really that's the only qualification you need to do fluorescent photomicroscopy. Um, otherwise, it's just a matter of uh, beaming the appropriate wavelength of short wave or of uh, UV light onto the subject and capturing your, the response just like you would with a regular fluorescent specimen. And you know, plus stacking and everything else. But like this is this is a real nightmare. So I mean, like you know, 300 shots stacking that, then you've got to clear the the daylight uh, uh, paraphernalia out of the way and introduce the uh, the short wave source without shifting the field of view too much, uh, so that ideally you get a perfect match between those two. Yeah, not quite. Uh, and then you have to do the whole 300 uh, shot stack again, and then you have to process each of them individually. And everything else, it's. Uh, yeah, it's tedious, but no, there's no particular trick to it. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's about it for the photography. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I've come over the dark side a little bit, I think, although I would still prefer that my micros be as non-micro as possible. Um, but you know, this, this whole, that's right, yeah. Uh, but this whole foray into photomicroscopy has indeed given me a, a, a better appreciation of the micro world uh, and, uh, it seems the micro world seems to appreciate me fairly well as, uh, also. So that's it. Thank you very much. All right. you're on, you're on. So yes, questions. Oh, sorry, Frank. Yeah. yeah uh, do you use anything in particular to hold and orient the sample so it comes out where you want it and you expect it to be A bowl of rice. <laughs> uh, that yeah, that's a trick I learned from uh, from the Horvas. Um, Oh, wait, there it is. Uh, where was it? No. Oh, is, is that come from George Chow? Yeah. Uh, let me show you my, I'll, I'll leave it on the uh, picture of my setup here. There we go. Uh, no, can't see the rice there. There. So there's, there's the bowl of rice there. Um, there are, there are different strategies you can use. Um, and depending on the specimen, I, I might, do other certain tricks, you know, blue sticky tack or whatever. Um, for for smaller stuff, especially though the rice is best because it doesn't drift. Once you set it, it's it's, it's or or a sandbag is something else that I've I've used it as well, or a bowl of sand. At some point, it must be more useful for you to use put the, the sample on the stack shot and keep the camera zooming on the top. That? Right. So there is, um, yeah. So if you're using a, a microscope based system, for example, it is, it's easier to, to motorize the stage rather than the optics. Um, that's just a matter of the way the system is built though, in terms of the end result of the optics. Um, I, I off the top of my head, I can't think of an argument in favor of one or the other. Um, the reason for me why the camera is mounted on the stack shot and not the specimen is, um, you see in the background, I have the whole rig mounted to a copy stand. Uh, well, actually it's an enlarger stand. And so what that means is I can very easily grab the clamp and, and elevate the whole system out of the way while I manipulate the specimen and then bring it back down. So it's just, it's logistics more than anything, but uh, yeah, my choice is the camera moving the camera. Yeah, that, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, you would also, in theory, you would also have to uh, sequentially elevate the lighting to, to maintain uh, that, uh, that relationship. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's also, there's also probably more of a problem of, of lateral misalignment between the camera and the specimen if it's drifting. Um, it's easier to orient the camera along the optical axis so there's no drift. But anyway. Michael, you had a question that I, that I shunted off to the end. Do you remember what it was? That had to do with uh, the fact that uh, Biontech allows you to take a movie. Oh, yes, right, the movie. And maybe a brief question is, how did you come up with the 300 some odd steps? <laughs> you know, that's a very good question. Yeah. How, do, you remember, I how, <laughs> how do I know? OK, so uh, yes, I will answer both of those by uh, going back to uh, Frank's magical uh, appetite here. So basically what I have done by taking each of these shots is created a movie. If I play them back in rapid succession, there's a movie, you know, going back and forth. So 
so yeah, in theory, the idea of recording a video and pumping that into, uh, into a, a stack, uh, it's the same principle. There are drawbacks, however. Number one, uh, most cameras are not recording at their full resolution in video mode. They're recording at a, at a limited resolution. If that's enough for you, then fair enough, that's fine. The other issue is that you have to make sure that you work out the shutter speed and the, the speed of the, of the stack um, such that you're, you're not capturing any motion blur during the process of, of, of filming the, the, the video. So uh, most video these days is shot at a uh, progressive frame rate of 30 frames per second. So progressive means that it scans the whole field of view in one shot. Um, and so it's 1 30th of a second per frame. And so 1 30th of a second, depending on how fast the camera is traveling, you could be getting motion blur as you're going. So that would be the other caveat with that. So resolution and the, the possibility of motion blur would be the two reasons I would prefer not to shoot uh, in a movie format. That said, a lot of what I do is overkill for most practical uses of such things. If all you're doing is posting pictures on Facebook and Mindat and that sort of stuff, it's probably fine. But I, I'm a control freak and a, and a perfectionist, so I go to the nth degree anyway. But in terms of the number of stacks, how do I know? Um, that's fairly straightforward. There are various um, depth of field calculators. Uh, and so for any lens of a given numerical aperture at a given uh, uh, magnification, I can calculate the depth of field. Now, you mentioned earlier about uh, iris also affecting the depth of field. Absolutely true. Uh, by closing down the iris, uh, that auxiliary iris that I have in my system, I'm also increasing the depth of field. So I, I can take that into account when I'm doing my depth of field calculations. But really, at the end of the day, what it boils down to is that there is a finite distance that is within acceptable focus. That's the depth of field. So as long as you know what that depth of field is, um, I just move the camera to, to, the, to the lowest point and say, OK, that's the back of the crystal. That's the front of the crystal. The depth of field is this. I need to overlap by one third for each step. The computer calculates that it requires 300 steps to get from here to there with that depth of field. That's, that's it. Um, and so you're right. Uh, you might be uh, fine to get away with 12 shots. I mean, not as compared to 300, but you know, um, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm talking about really the optimal quality possible um, there is, uh, okay, well, so in determining depth of field, there is a concept called circle of confusion, uh, which I actually, which I actually learned in film school just down the road in Welland. Uh, and there were, there were jokes for days about how big is your circle of confusion right now, especially after a lecture like this. And, uh, so what the circle of confusion basically comes down to is it's a tolerance measure. So in order to determine an, an a, a a functional depth of field, you need, you need to determine a measure of tolerance within the system. And so that circle of confusion can be bigger or smaller. And so you can get away with, with, with fewer shots. I'm sure I could get away with fewer shots probably, but in my uh, pursuit of ridiculous perfection, I, I choose not to. So that's, yeah. You also said when you were talking about April Chromium, the SMS, that you couldn't correct for the uh, uh, black chromatic aberration. Yeah. Yeah, in Photoshop, it's just a checkbox. Well, the lateral chromatic aberrational, uh, chromatic aberrations is just a checkbox uh, in Photoshop. Uh, the the blue, the purple green, the the longitudinal uh, CAs are are a slider, but it's it's almost as easy. Yeah. You would want to stack the different color frequencies differently. Well, I mean, you could. But now, now that is going a little bit too slow. Now, so I mean, there, there is, again, it's a, a matter of tolerance. So when I say you can correct for chromatic aberrations, first, I've selected lenses that are almost entirely free of chromatic aberrations. I'm not trying to deal with you know, nightmare scenarios with, with the C8. So, so the first line of defense is getting a good lens. Uh, what little difference there, is, there may be left at the extremes, uh, I can easily correct for in software. Um, might it be marginally better to separate and stack individual color channels? Yes, but that would require photographing individual color channels. I would have to repeat the stack three times, each with a red, green, and blue filter on the lens. You can't just separate the white or the, the, the white light um, 
result in post and get the same effect of stacking three individual color channels. You would have to photograph it separately. No, you couldn't separate them without treating the colors? You can, except unless you're, well, okay, this is, most everybody can probably tune out for the rest of this discussion, but um, uh, you, yeah, there is, on, on most digital cameras, there's, there's a filter on, in front of the sensor, which is called a bear mask. And so um, you are not recording reliably red, green, blue, red, green, blue with each successive pixel, but rather you're recording red, green, green, blue, green, green. There's twice as much green as there is red and blue. Um, and so uh, there are various, uh, well, there, there are algorithms that control how that then is mapped into a, into a white light image. And uh, so if, if you are wanting to achieve the kind of marginal improvement you're talking about by individual color separation, you need to also bypass the algorithm in the camera that is messing, that is combining them in the first place. So, uh, so if you want the ultimate in, in resolution, yes, you, you could, but you would have to photograph them separately. The other option, uh, Quentin, this is for you, uh, Pentax has a wonderful special feature, which is a uh, high resolution mode, whereby it, uh, it takes one photograph, it shifts the, the sensor slightly, takes another, shifts it again, and takes a third, such that each pixel receives red, green, and blue uh, color information. That kind of a photograph you could separate later. Uh, but unless, unless you are shooting with a Foveon chip, which doesn't have a bare, bare mask, it, it, it's more like film, or if you're um, doing a, a, a high color rendition mode like with Pentax, maybe, but otherwise no. Uh, Michael, we have a, a couple of uh, questions and comments from uh, folks on the... That's enough out of you, Michael. All right. Back. <laughs> yeah. Um, so and to the floor. Does, uh, does the read handle raw images and does it produce a raw output? It does not. And if, uh, and, and, uh, if you believe that Helicon does, you're fooling yourself and buying into the marketing hype. Because, uh, yeah, so Helicon uh, advertises that it can accept uh, raw, well, DNG images. Um, it doesn't. What it does is it can internally um, process your DNGs to TIFFs, which it then uses to create the stack. So Helicon is not giving you any advantage by that except eliminating one step in, in the process. Uh, so no, uh, Helicon or uh, Zareen does not do that for you. I do that in Photoshop. Uh, I convert all my RAWs to, uh, to TIFF, stack them, and then output to a final 16-bit uh, TIFF, which then I bring back into Photoshop and, and do the editing. Um, and yeah, Helicon, uh, it, as a matter of convenience, saves you that pre preliminary step but is actually behind the scenes doing exactly the same thing. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, uh, how do you diffuse the UV light? I don't. Uh, so um, generally speaking, uh, most of the light uh, that, is, um, that I put onto the specimen is diffused. Uh, so it's going through a, a, a translucent material that diffuses the rays, so it's not getting hard shadows and, and high, um, high reflections. Um, but that's necessary because it's a reflected light scenario. So what I'm seeing there is the light that is being reflected off of the specimen is behaving as it is based on the diffusion that I use, whatever. But it, it's the light that is reflecting off the specimen. Uh, in fluorescent photography, you are not photographing UV light that is reflecting off the specimen. Rather, you are, reflecting, you are photographing the light that is being generated internally from the specimen. And so the only way to diffuse that light would be to put a diffusion in front of the lens, basically. So there is no lighting when it comes to fluorescent photography because you're just capturing the, the actual um, output of photons from the specimen itself. Okay. So um, uh, the, for those at home, the question was, do you need a UV blocker? Um, it is generally good practice to use a UV filter, like a, a band stop uh, filter for UV um, when you're doing ultraviolet shooting uh, in theory. In practice, I have found it's not all that necessary. Most digital uh, camera sensors are built with um, infrared and UV filters on the chip. So unless you're getting some, uh, some like a fluorescent response in the lens itself, 
it's generally unnecessary. Um, but a UV uh, bandstop filter would uh, eliminate any internal fluorescence of the lens. Yeah. Um, how, how do you clean the specimens before shooting? <laughs> uh, yeah, with 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 uh, with uh, breath held in a very small brush. Um, I don't know. I mean, depending, it depends on what the specimen is. I mean, it's all the standard um, uh, uh, strategies. You know, you can you can dunk it in water and gently just sort of swish it about and hope that the heavier materials will fall off. Uh, you can use a gentle uh, uh, air burst of air from uh, either the, uh, the squeeze bulb lower brush thing, or, or I wouldn't use a canned air for two reasons. Um, canned air, one can tend to be too strong and will blow uh, little crystals off the, the matrix, but also there can be various residues that come out with the, uh, the air uh, that deposit themselves in the crystal and now you've got a real problem on your hand. Um, same reason, don't use compressed air for cleaning lenses or, or camera sensors, by the way. Um, yeah, but yeah, I also have a series of paint brushes, some of which even just have like a single hair on them. And like, if there's, there's that one little bit of dust that's, that's bothering me, I'll get under a microscope with a single hair and, and knock it off. It's... How long have you been married for? <laughs> yeah. well, long enough, she, uh, she, she, knows, she, she knows and will put up with all of my, uh, my quirks. And you, um, uh, the question is, do you start with a test shot without optimal quality to just make sure that you know you're heading in the right direction? I guess. And yep. Is that like a live view on your uh, camera or monitor? Uh, I don't trust live view. Um, I uh, well, I don't know. It's yes and no. So uh, I I still shoot with a DSLR, which is to say that I, I have an optical preview of my actual shot. Uh, it doesn't really apply in this kind of world. Um, I'm shooting mirrorless for this primarily to eliminate the vibration of the big mirror in a DSLR. Um, but also being mirrorless means that there is no optical preview. You can only preview electronically. So that somewhat eliminates the argument for, oh, I don't like live view. Um, but in terms of evaluating the final image quality, though, still, um, I mean, you can tell relative intensity, directionality of the lights, that sort of stuff in live view. Uh, my new camera is much better with live view than my 10-year-old one. Um, so uh, I, I rough a lot of it in, in terms of framing, specimen positioning, lighting, using the live view, yes. But then in order to get uh, a critical evaluation of the result and also to determine uh, exposure, I will just take a picture. And, and so the slide that is up right now is uh, representative of the kind of like test shot, as, as we've mentioned, that I might take first to evaluate, uh, you know, critical evaluation of the lighting and exposure before I commit to the full stack. Okay. And uh, third, last question, and I'll have one more comment. Um, how do you deal with uh, crystal faces reflecting the light? Um, well, so you don't, uh, is, the, is the, the short answer. So, um, Hang on. Uh, in extreme examples, uh, there are various um, lighting. Uh, oh, I don't have it there. There are various uh, lighting strategies that you can use to deal with uh, extremely reflective surfaces. Uh, so, like Frank's uh, pyrite obsession, I, I employed various strategies to deal with uh, with that. Um, the um, the basic principle behind mineral photography, the lighting for mineral photography, is that you want to orient the specimen and the lights. So that's a relative relationship. So like you can turn the specimen and you turn the lights as well, um, or you can turn the specimen or you can move the light. So that there's a relative relationship also including the camera, of course. But so the idea though is that you set up your base um, uh, positioning so that you're not getting any reflections off the crystal faces. Um, and then you work to introduce the, uh, the reflections on the crystal faces that you want. Um, so the, the, the first uh, and most important thing in specimen lighting is positioning the lights, the specimen, and the camera such that there are no inherent reflections off of the specimen, and then you build it up from there. Okay. And uh, the, the comment... Oh, was... actually, sorry. Uh, just before we move on. Uh, one last point, the slide that's up there now, I, I have one, well, there, I have a ping pong ball out of which I have drilled the top and bottom.
that sits just around the uh, around the specimen and around the uh, the uh, objective itself. So for extreme cases where where there are just reflections that I cannot deal with, I will diffuse it to such a ridiculous extent that it becomes uh, less of a problem. So the ping pong ball is the ex other extreme of that discussion. So and, and the, the the picture on screen is showing the uh, the base of uh, rice or uh, yes. The golden specimen, and then people commented on other materials that they used. Uh, Quinton was saying that he uh, uses crushed granite for aquariums. Ah. So there's uh, all the there's angular lots of different uh, materials that uh, folks can uh, experiment. But the mice really appreciate the, the rice that I leave out for yes. them. That's yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much, Michael. My pleasure. Uh, it uh, for you. Yeah. Uh, if there are any other questions, of course, I'm around for the rest of the symposium, so feel free to uh, come and accost me at any point. So, thank you. Uh, okay, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to stop the uh, screen sharing. Uh, and uh, um, I, I just wanted to uh, to kind of address the uh, the combined crowd we have. Uh, we have, um, uh, I guess, it's sixteen uh, people on on Zoom, and we have um, I think it's twenty two people here in the room. So uh, you know, combined, we've got uh, you know a crowd of about forty, um, which is uh, a nice turnout. And uh, uh, it, it's great that we're able to accommodate uh, those that weren't able to, uh, to attend in person. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, to mention that uh, we, we do have the other presentations will be on Zoom. Um, uh, this evening, uh, we're targeting a 7.45 p.m. start. Um, and uh, tomorrow, uh, 11 a.m. Um, so for those that are joining via Zoom, there is a, a unique uh, Zoom invite uh, URL for each of these presentations. So uh, uh, look at the email that was sent out and, and select the appropriate one. Um, and uh, uh, appreciate you bearing with us uh, as we navigate through this new technology, uh, new setup, uh, new location for for uh, this evening's talk and so on and uh, you know we will try to uh, to get through this in a way that produces uh, you know better than a reasonable result um, Frank. so yep hi Quentin yeah uh, you at one point you had 20 zoom participants and one of them Emil is in England oh <laughs> And He's a university student in Newcastle. <laughs> you, you, you know, there, there's always someone who comes in and tries to beat me for the prize of who came from furthest away. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> it's, it's usually Steve Sorrell. Um, yeah, not this time. <laughs> but not this time. Uh, well, you know, welcome, Emil. Glad to have you with us. Um, Thank you. So, in terms of timing, uh, it is 3.45. Um, the labs here will be open until 4.45, uh, and then we will close them down um, and uh, have an hour break. The, uh, the, the, the bar will open um, at 5.45 with the uh, banquet dinner to follow um, by 6.15. Um, and after that, we will have our raucous auction, which is our new branding for the uh, voice auction. Uh, raucous auction. Yes, as opposed to silent. Um, and following that, uh, we will have our uh, evening presentation. So uh, uh, look You're forward. Uh, I am Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks, Michael. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, 
Uh, no, the, uh, the, the evening presentation will be at the banquet site. Um, and then following that, we will reconvene for uh, some more good cheer in the fireplace lounge. Um, so uh, uh, thanks everyone for, for joining online. Um, I, I hope it was a good experience for you. Um, and we will uh, reconvene in, uh, in a few hours. Hi, Steve. Hi, Rachel. See you then. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Yeah. Hello. Okay, so with, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the, the Zoom meeting. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll see everyone in, well, three hours for the, uh, the evening presentation. Have a great dinner. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Yeah.